Dr. Shabir, welcome to Let the Quran Speak. My pleasure to be on. We're starting a new series, Fantastical Stories in the Quranic Commentaries. And Dr. Shabir, this was spurred on by the idea that when we think of God, we understand that God can do everything, right? God can do miracles, God can do things that defy our imagination. And yet, when we look at some of the Quran commentaries, and, and some of the things that the commentators have said about verses of the Quran, they seem a little bit to stretch our imagination a bit too much, right? To defy science, to defy what we know of the world. So how do we understand those stories, Dr. Shabir? And I think that's the point of this new series. Yeah, yeah. Uh, certainly there are statements in the Quran which require us to just submit and, and believe. There are things uh, which we are called on to believe in even though we don't see. And uh, there are miracles described in the Quran which uh, Muslims naturally acquiesce in uh, because we know this to be the word of God. So we take it that, okay, so we know this to be a, a factual statement and, and then we just modify our thinking to align with the factual statement. But if somebody comes with another story um, which is either equally or even more fantastic than, than what is mentioned in the Quran, then uh, naturally we, we want to know, like, is, who said that? Where is it from? Is it from an authentic source? Uh, how can we know that that is true? Um, and some of the stories which are mentioned in Quran commentaries are such that even some of the most conservative scholars nowadays uh, would say, no, this uh, cannot be true. It's not uh, something Muslims need to believe in. Uh, and, and then they would blame these on foreign elements. They would say that these stories were invented by uh, people of the book, uh, and sometimes they, they name um, Israelites in particular, and hence they call these stories Israelite tales, or Israeliyat, as they are called in, in Arabic. And uh, uh, so, so with that bl broad blanket, they can easily discard these stories and say, okay, we don't have to believe them. But the, the problem for uh, traditional exegetes of the Quran is that uh, s uh, many of these stories are related by important people in our history, especially mm. companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And uh, uh, their idea of, of exegesis is that uh, you cannot use reason. Mm. You, you have to uh, follow the interpretations that were given by the, pre by the pious predecessors. In fact, whole books have been written about this. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, who is one of the uh, stalwarts of the, uh, what we might call the modern Salafist uh, movement, uh, he, he wrote a book called Al-Muqaddimah Fi Usul Tafsir, uh, Introduction to the uh, Principles of Tafsir. That book has been translated, uh, available in English. It's a small volume. But the contents of that has uh, also, the contents have also been incorporated into uh, the introduction uh, by Ibn Kathir to his tafsir, his commentary on the Quran. And Ibn mm -hmm. Kathir's uh, commentary has become a very popular commentary nowadays, especially uh, used by people who are following that uh, Salafi bent of uh, thinking, which is characterized by a fair degree of literalism, uh, a, a shunning of reason, and reliance on uh, tradition. So uh, how then, according to Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Kathir, uh, is the Quran to be explained? Uh, much of what they say is what we agree on in principle, but uh, we would add a good dose of reason in approaching all of these. But they wanted to shun reason, so this is how it goes. Uh, first, the Quran should be interpreted in the light of itself, a reasonable principle. Part of the Quran may explain another part. Mm -hmm. If the, if the explanation is not found in the Quran itself or the Quranic verses, we turn to the Prophet's explanation. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the prime exegete of the Quran. God commissioned him to explain the Quran. We agree with all of that, especially in reference to Surah 16, verse number 44, which uh, presents the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as the prime exegete of the Quran. Okay, so we're good so far. Next, if we don't find it in the prophet's explanation, we go to the explanation of the companions of the prophet, peace be upon him, uh, because they lived with the prophet, walked with him, they heard his explanations directly, they knew what the Quran is about. If this first community of Muslims did not understand the, the book, then there is uh, you know, something wrong. Mm -hmm, they they mm -hmm. must have understood it. So, okay, so far, so good. And then, if it's not found in the explanations of the companions of the prophet, peace be upon him, then we go to the successors of the companion, who are called Tabi'a Tabi'in, uh, sorry, the Tabi'in. Uh, so the, the, the companions are called Sahaba, 
and uh, the followers are called tabi'in, which literally means followers, the successors of the companions. And I said taba tabi'in, that refers to an even further generation, the followers of the followers, but we don't have to go there in terms of the, of the tafsir, according to, to uh, Ibn Taymiyyah. Because mm -hmm. by the time we get to the tabi'in, the successors of the companions, meaning the second generation of Muslims, we already see a wide variety of opinions on what the Quran means. And, uh, and, and so y this information is not definitive. It's good to look at what they say, uh, but you, know, you might have to choose one over another because some of them say this and some of them say the other. So now, the, what the companions uh, say, this is uh, quite definitive. Uh, this is the earliest, the first generation. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, our Christian friends thinking about the, the apostles of, of Jesus. Uh, so what they understood to be the mission of Jesus, that must be it. Mm -hmm. The difficulty now for the traditional exegetes, those who follow this kind of literalism and they want to shun reason, the reason is not going to play a part here, we're just going to follow the tradition, is that uh, many of these fantastic stories uh, are uh, attributed to the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And given their methodology of tracing things through isnads, that's an Arabic for support, and it, mean, it refers to technically uh, to the uh, relay chain of transmitters. So it comes from this person to this person to this person till it reaches us. Do we know all of the persons? Did they meet each other? Is this what would be regarded as, as a sahih or an authentic chain of relay persons? Going back all to the named source. So uh, the named source is often somebody like Ibn Abbas, a companion of the Prophet, peace be upon him, who himself is known to be a, a, a good expositor of the Quran. He's called in Arabic, Turjuman al-Quran, mm -hmm. the one who translates or explain, expounds the Quran. And uh, to persons like Ibn Masud, who uh, is said to have boasted that you know, he learned so much of the exegesis of the Quran from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and other companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, as well. So uh, some of the narratives, uh, Ibn Kathir and others, are able to discount as being, you know, creditable to Kaab al-Ahbar, um, uh, one of the uh, early Muslims, mm -hmm. uh, but not known to be a companion of the Prophet, peace be upon him, but having a Jewish background. So he knew Jewish tales and stories. Uh, these were fed by him to the Muslims who then related these stories. And uh, another person, Wahhab Manabba, Wahhab, uh, the son of Manabba, uh, was also uh, said to be one of those who related these uh, kinds of stories. And then there was uh, a known companion of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Abdullah bin Salam, who uh, was a Jewish rabbi before he embraced Islam. And so he must so have come. I hear that Jewish, you know, yes, referred yes. to again and again. A, a lot yeah. of this, uh, you know, it, th this becomes an easy label for, like for the Muslims yeah. to mm -hmm. say, okay, uh, you know, we don't have to accept this and let's blame it on the mm -hmm. Jewish people. Yeah. Um, uh, but, you know, they lived in a milieu in which certain stories were being bandied about. Uh, some of it they must have developed themselves. And we will see when we look at the details of the stories that the stories actually have uh, a Muslim flavor uh, to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, what do you take of the idea that when Jesus uh, wanted to resurrect somebody from the dead, he would uh, pray two rakats of prayer, and in the two rakats he would recite uh, Surat al-Mulk, which is the 67th chapter of the Quran, followed, and followed by Surat al-Sajda, which is the 32nd chapter of the Quran. So, mm -hmm. it, it, obviously, this uh, story I mean, at least this part of the story has the flavor of, of Islamicity about it. Mm -hmm. It's like Muslims thinking about what Jesus must have done, and they're transporting Jesus into the Muslim milieu uh, to, to, to have Jesus think and act like the Muslims would think and act in the milieu in which these stories were uh, being uh, transmitted mm -hmm. and, and related from one person to another. So even if it was invented outside of the Muslim community, or even if we start with a basic core story that originated outside of the Muslim community, uh, it, it then developed within the Muslim community and it took on uh, a Muslim rendering mm -hmm. eventually. And we see the final output to, to have a Muslim uh, stamp on it. I look forward to hearing these stories because when I look at the verses, the, these stories don't pop out. It's only in the, in the commentaries and they, 
sometimes seem very far removed from the verses themselves. So I'm excited um, to learn about them for once. So thank you for that, Dr. Shabir. You're welcome. On behalf of Let the Quran Speak, I want to say thank you. You've helped us become the most widely watched Muslim TV show in Canada. I want to appeal to you to continue to support us. You can visit our website, QuranSpeaks.com. We also accept e-transfers to iGive at QuranSpeaks.com. And we're now on Patreon, so you can make a monthly contribution. May God bless you and your loved ones today and always.